Hi, thank you for coming. I am Jung Lok. And today's Zoom event, we are going to focus on uh, Sumie brushes. I have a short PowerPoint, as you can see in the background, uh, but then, you know, since this is a live Zoom event, so what I'm going to do is um, I will have some of the notes on the PowerPoint. So in case I, uh, I notice that some people like to write notes about what I talk about because a lot of time is related to techniques and um, just good information. So um, I have the PowerPoint to promote that. And um, so let's talk about this. Okay, the, let's go to the next page. Okay, what I plan to cover today, I have to say that within 40 minutes, we'll probably be doing it very quick. And just in case we why did not cover all of them, we will spill over to the next um, event because I need to finish this within 40 minutes or so. Um, to ensure that people have a chance to grab something to eat as uh, some of us will be joining again at one. All right. So what I'm going to talk about today is basically the Sumie brush. And for the Sumie brush, what I want to talk about is, first of all, what is the basic structure, the construction of it, and then what kind of material we use for the Sumie brush. And as a matter of fact, what I want to is also do a comparison between the Sumie brush and a typical watercolor brush, right? So because there is a little bit of difference, but there are a lot of similarities. And then what we are going to also talk about is for Sumie brushes, so what are the common uses for the soft hair, hard hair, and also the combination brushes? Then we'll come to something that we always talk about is the four criteria of how to pick a good Sumie brush. And this has been passed down in you know, the history of learning calligraphy. When, when we learn calligraphy, we, we always look at you know, what is a good Sumie brush, what is a good calligraphy brush. And as a matter of fact, what I find out is that when I look at this, this is actually nothing different than picking a good watercolor brush, right? So, um, but then there is a particular point that in the Chinese one, we have one description that covered two different characteristics of a watercolor brush. So we'll cover that. And if we have time, we also talk about how to open a new brush, a brand new brush, because I have seen, you know, various information or unfortunately misinformation of how to open a Sumie brush. Sometimes if you soak it too much, you actually hurt the groove. And also, you know, like cleaning the brush and also storing the brush, because as I say, uh, there are various kind of information. Of course, there's more than one way to achieve the same result, but then there may be some misinformation that I want to clarify. So first of all, the structure of a Sumie brush. Okay. Oh, by the way, um, I just want to remind people that, you know, like uh, this particular, um, okay, let me just make sure that everybody is new. This is ABC News. Okay. Um, okay, thank you. So uh, I have muted everybody. So if you um, need to say something, please unmute yourself, all right? Because we want to make sure we don't have any particular background noises. Um, the Zoom event is free, but then in order to substantiate um, my operation, I would um, love for you to consider enrolling in my online workshop. My online workshop, uh, for the most part, is affordably priced at $35 per session and each section is two and a half hour long. And I do do a lot of um, preparations to ensure that the two and a half hour is really well spent, that we cover a lot of aspect of the subject we are talking about. You also have a chance to email up to three pieces of artwork for my critiques and suggestions. And also you will be invited to the free Zoom event. And the free Zoom event is every other two to three months and it mostly would be on techniques and a lot of information that people like to have, such as seal placement, uh, signature, and of course, today we'll talk about brushes. And of course, if you are not interested in taking any of my workshop, but would like to join my free Zoom event, or just want to um, uh, give your support, I do appreciate um, donation. You can donate online on my website, or you can send me a check, and I'll, uh, uh, any amount is welcome. And I thank you for the support. So um, let's go to the first part of it is the structure of a Sumie watch. Um, so let's get to the um, structure first. 
Okay, so what I want to talk a little bit about is the structure of a um, brush. So let me just do that. This is upside down. It should be the other way around. Yes, that's better. Okay. Okay. Now, when we talk about a Sumie brush, what we usually talk about I have in front of me a Sumie brush and a typical watercolor brush. And for the watercolor brush, I'm talking about the wrong one, right? Of course, we also have flat and some other shape, just as fan and other things. But today's presentation, we are mostly talking about the wrong, okay? And when you look at it from a distance, you may not see any difference between a typical watercolor brush and a, a watercolor wrong brush and a Sumie brush. But if you look at it closer for a Sumie brush and versus a watercolor brush, you know, like they, they may look the same, but if you really look at the hair, especially, and this is a brand new one, but if you look at one that has been open, like this, it has been open, what you will see is the hair. To the most part, are the same length, right? And then when you look at a watercolor brush, what you will see is you can see here the tip, the very end of the hair is actually cut to form this horn shape. While in this Sumei brush, if you press it down, you know, like the, they are pretty, almost the same length. Of course, you know, there may be a little bit of angle, but then in this, if you press down, you will see that the length is different. It has been cut, right? So, so that's one of the key difference. Of course, there are exceptions to all of them. You know, there may be Sume brush that has this structure and there may be watercolor brush that has this structure. I mean, there's no exception, but then to the most part, the watercolor brush, the hair are cut while the Sume brush is kind of the same length. So how is it done, all right? So um, I actually have been to a, um, brush making workshop in Canada. Um, now it's probably around 10 years ago. And we have a brush maker that actually show us how to um, make Sumie brushes. So let me just do an example from here. So I obviously don't have, you know, like um, different um, hair to actually, you know, like reconstruct that. But say for example, these are lines of here and this is the tip. This is the tip, the end of this, and this is the end, right? So when we make a sumi brush, we'll line the hair together with the end tip here. And by the way, um, for sumi brush, the tip of the hair are always the natural ending. What I mean by natural ending is, for example, see, I myself have long hair, so with if I have long hair, like this is where it go out from, this is the tip. So these are the tip, but my hair would not be good enough because these are hair that has been cut. These are hair not at birth. What we want is, is the hair that has never been cut. So that's why in the olden times in China, um, people, when they have the first haircut for babies, sometimes they will actually save the hair and bring it to a brush maker and make a brush for the baby. Because the first hair, these were grown out, you know, from the baby, you know, the first tip that has never been cut. Because when you really think about this, 
the hair that grow out, like this is the head, right? This is the scalp. And when the hair come out, if you put it on a magnifying glass, it's gathered to a natural end. But once you cut it, this will be the cut end. The cut end is not good for brushes. Only the natural tip, this is good for brushes. So that's why we use the baby hair because you can only have it once. So even I have really long hair, my hair is not good because it's already been cut. The end will be this, would be the blunt area and it would not be good. I want this. And for all Sume brushes, as I say, there are exceptions because they are synthetics and they are other material now, but then for the majority of Sume brushes that are of natural hair, these are the natural ending. So we are talking about these are the natural ending and these are the cut end. You line them up and if you want to do a brush like this, instead of lining it up you know, parallel, we actually use a knife and cut this at an angle, right? And after I, let me just make sure Okay, at an angle. This will be the tip, the length of you know what I want to make. This will be, you know, like um some of the slight shading, right? So this is not a very high angle, by the way, is it's just slightly slanted. And then what I will do is I will start rolling from here, roll all the hair together. And then, and then there will be some natural shading, but this natural shading is not as severe as this. Majority of the time, it's a very slight angle. As I say, I mean, I exaggerate a little bit, but it's a very slight angle. So all these are the natural tip of the brush of the hair that is nev has never been cut. And that's why they can get back to a point very naturally because all these natural tips can gather and stick together. If you have this cut end, it would not gather as well. And those are these. These would not gather as well, but these, because they are the natural end, they would gather. So that's kind of the main difference of the construction of a Sumire brush, natural ending, and also very close to same length. All right, so that's one of the major difference. So now talking about the kind of materials. So I have um, soft hair, hard hair and combination. So let's get back to my PowerPoint. Okay. These are the hair that is typically used for a sume brush, all right? So, so we can see that for the soft hair, mainly they are um, gold. And on the, on the photo, you will see that these are the white one. And I have, you know, like also have, you know, sample of how the hair were lined up. And then for different length, then you have different length for the uh, brush. And these, the first one, the, on the right is the soft one, and soft one mostly is goat, but then we can have sheep, we can have rabbit, and some other animal that have soft, absorbent hair. And then the second one is the hard hair. Hard hair are mainly the horse hair, and the horse hair could be uh, from the mane of the horse or from the tail of the horse, right? And of course, they have different property. And another one for hard hair would be the one on the left, which is the weasel. And a lot of times in the translation, because the weasel uh, are made up of three words, yellow mouse wolf. Yellow mouse wolf is the weasel in English. But then um, when we describe the hair used in the brush, we call it wolf hair. And because we only use, out of the three words, only use one word. So a lot of times this has been mistranslated and they call it wolf hair. So a lot of times if you see a brush company that sell brushes and they say wolf hair is actually weasel hair. And this is the tail of a weasel. And as I say, it has never been cut. So all the natural ending 
of a weasel tail would become a brush, all right? So that is the hard hair. It could be a weasel, it could be horse, and then we have combination. And what is combination? Um, combination is this. When we have the hair, we have this layer of the soft hair, then what we'll do is we'll find some hard hair. It could be, for example, the mountain horse hair. We'll put it in the middle and you know, put you know, like a sufficient amount, you know, depending on how much, how strong you want it, and then or the proportion. And then you put the hard hair in the middle, and then you roll the soft hair on the outer layer. So I have a combination brush. This is a typical combination brush. This is a ideal, all right? And you will see that the hard hair is the yellow one, which is in the center. And then it's covered by a continuous coat of white hair surrounding it. And that is a combination brush. And uh, if you have been my student, you know that I, um, uh, one of my specialties is painting flowers uh, in the Ningnan style. And the Ningnan style really favor the use of combination brush. So a lot of my brushes, even I have different kinds, but then they are combination brushes. Some of these are some of the ones that I really use, so they are quite worn out, but you see that they are combination brush. They have different hair in the inside and it's different from the color in the outside, right? So different combination brush. But of course I do have brushes that is just one kind of hair, for example, this one, uh, actually this one is also combination. This is two kind of hair. This is the hard hair. You can see it's darker color. This is kind of like a horse hair in the middle and then the weasel hair in the outer layer. While this one would be the, this is actually weasel hair in the middle and then goat hair on the outer. So even combination brush, it will have different quality, different softness. And also the amount of um, hard hair you use in the core also kind of alter how stiff um, the quality of the hard hair and how absorbent is how much water it can carry on the outer layer. So, so different combination brush. Now we, Come to the um, and other um, uh, area of the brush, and that is the structure of a watercolor brush. I mean, I do that because I want to make sure that um, you understand. Um, for watercolor brush, of course, there are multiple different kinds, but then. The, with your watercolors, you know that, you know, like people keep talking about the Koninsky stable. Koninsky stable is, um, is believed to be the best watercolor brush because it has the bounce, it has the spring and snap and also carry a lot of water. But then one of the reasons is because it's natural hair. Remember I talk about the tip of the brush, then you can see in the diagram that, you know, it gathered to be a very nice tip. And by the way, the one that you are looking at is a Koninsky. And then the, the, you know, like one step lower because Koninsky brush, it sells for hundreds of dollars. So uh, it's, it has to be a particular kind of um, uh, squirrel or uh, that is uh, from Siberia. You know? and, and so the production is really um, limited. So, um, uh, you know, like we, even, even brushes, they are called Koninsky stable. They may not be the true Koninsky stable now. Um, so the next one would be squirrel hair, and of course it's a tail of the squirrel, and um, you know, like that would be something that you would run to buy. And another common name would be camel, but then honestly, it's not really the hair of the camel; it's actually more to the color, because when you look at the, um, uh, let's see the the one that I have um, in my hand, you know, like uh, I'll I'll change those screen a little bit, but then, you know, like the hair is kind of like a golden brown. So yeah, a lot of times the golden brown one is called a camel. And, um, but then honestly, it could be some other animal hair. It's not really from a camel. It's actually could be from a pig, from a uh, goat, from a boar, from an ox. So it could be different kind of animal hair. 
And of course, we add synthet synthetic ones to it. So beside natural hair, they will also have different kind of nylon and um, addition of this. And by the way, um, not all Sume brushes are natural hair uh, because of production costs and things like that. Um, other synthetic material nylon and other things could be added to a Sume brush as well. However, the production cost is still relatively cheap and um, so the majority of Sume brushes are still made out of natural hair. So um, any questions on the structure before we go further? Are the um, Sume brushes, are any of them factory made or are they all handmade? They are, I mean like... Um, factory assembled, I mean. They're... Uh, even factory assembled, they have to be handmade. I mean, meaning that the production is, I mean, even for, uh, let me see, I have. Even for watercolor brushes, when I say factory made, it's mainly the, um, the sticking of the, of the, um, hair, or, or sometimes they call it the turf. I mean, there are all these different terminology into this. This part can be factory made. I mean, like the wood. And then of course in sume brushes could be the bamboo, right? It could be wood, it could be plastic, it could be bamboo, it could be, you know, some other things such as bone, you know, or I even have a collector brush that is made of, uh, Ceramic, right? So, so this part could be factory made, right? This part, which is to to hold, I mean, especially for watercolor brush, to hold the hair to the brush, um, machine will help, right? But when you look at this, for example, this is a mop brush, right? And these are done by hand, right? And I mean, these might be, you know, a machine help it, but these are done by hand. I'll show you in the work. Remember I told you I went to a workshop. This is the brush I made. Um, this is the brush I made. And of course, you know, like I, uh, you know, the workshop include material. So I picked the coolest one I can find, which is a stick of bamboo. And naturally, you know, I have some really, I mean, I just find this very interesting, but, but this is the, handle, right? And this is the hair. Remember, I mean, like, you see, I have my hard hair in the middle and I think they are like whister, like a cat whister or some other whister. Okay, whister. And these are gold hair. So I purposely for the, because I mean, uh, the teacher talked about you doing a funny brush because um, if a brush like this, you cannot predict what it will draw, right? But but then so I for the heck of it you know like I I I find it kind of cool to make a funny brush so so I purposely you know I have the hair very different length but but then these are all made by hand the rolling have to be made by hand because you actually cannot really mass produce it because hair is a very delicate thing so even on this when we say machine make um maybe it's the assembly of it is machine make but this part are kind of done by hand. So all these are done by hand. Even when we say factories, you are talking about smaller factories. Even the biggest factories are small factories um, because these are still, you know, handy work of the craftsmen. So, and that's why Koninsky and, you know, like a um, mop brush take a lot of hair. And these, you know, like this angle, as I say, this process is the same. You still have to, cut the hair on an angle. And then, you know, after you do that, you not, you not just roll, you actually stack them. And, you know, like you, you, you actually make sure that they are on a level before you can roll them. So all these cannot be done by machine. All these cannot be done by machine. All these cannot be done by machine. So, so even when we say that, uh, for example, you know, like a lot of stores um, would have, the, the name of the brush, you know, like this number two ideal, but it will talk about, you know, like 
uh, what is the, 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 the manufacturer. And when you see that, uh, a lot of them are actually smaller, regional, or um, even, even small shops. And they may not be mom and pop stops anymore. It's just like the um, uh, uh, rice paper uh, factories. I mean, they used to be mom and pop, but then because of the economy of scale, some of them were flow into bigger ones. But then even for the really big one, um, you probably see a lot of YouTube videos on that. Even for the really big one for rice paper, um, even for the machine make one, a lot of the process are done by hand. All right. So um, when it comes to these, majority of them, even the, the shop is a big shop, but then various kind of brush are actually done by hand with smaller shops. And there's so much pride in making the brush that you will see that these are, you know, like they would actually engrave the name there. Um, majority of time, these are like, for example, maybe you can see the difference, but for example, this particular brush, I can tell that this engraving is done by a machine because of the uniformity of these words, all right? But when you look at, um, this, this is actually gone, but when you look at some of the better brush, the engraving is actually done by um, hand. I can tell like this is this is the one that I keep showing my student because it's a mountain horse brush and this is small number one is by Zhou Ju Tang and which is one of the the um premier uh, brush manufacturer in Japan. I have to say that I, I wasn't looking for brushes, but I was in Kyoto and I kind of walked into it and of course I I bought the brush and <laughs> I I always told my student how expensive it is, is 5,500 yen plus tax. So after tax, I think it cost me like 63 US dollar for one single brush, mountain horse, small one. And that's why I, I always show my student how much it is because, um, uh, you know, because of how expensive it is, they are all handmade. And even these engraving are done by, um, done by hand. Wow, like this, probably a more factory manufacturer because this is actually a, a small landscape brush. And because of its size, because of its probably easier to manufacture quality, uh, it's probably cheaper. I mean, this is $63. This is probably around seven bucks. Um, so these are all, these are actually mach machine engraved. Okay, so, um, so we'll continue with the, um, Brushes and I already briefly talked about you know three kinds of brushes the um the uh uh combination the combination the um hard hair and the soft hair okay and um each of them would have different kind of use so let's just um talk a little bit about that for soft hair because of the absorbency, we will use it for things that is soft. For example, uh, in the lesson that we will work on, we can paint the baby chicks with soft hair brush only. You, you don't need a combination brush if, if you don't have one. So we can do that. Or we can paint something soft, such as you know, some flowers, um, or you can do um, you know, various kind of petals and blade of leaf you know, with a soft hair brush. Soft hair brush is also used for calligraphy. And uh, hard hair brush, hard hair brush, as I mentioned, because the head is, uh, hair is hard, is actually don't have a lot of absorbency. So the common use will be for um, doing, uh, for example, the wing of a bird, the tail of a rooster. You know, this will be done by a hard hair brush. Something that is stiff, so example, branches, uh, tree trunk, and you also want to do it with higher speed so you have some flying white so that would be a car a hard hair brush for combination brush which is my favorite brush as you see i have tons of them a lot of times i use it for almost everything and all, all of my flower painting because 
um, I want the bounce in the brush. So I use the combination brush so it can spring back to the um, um, initial form easier. And um, I'm running out of time, but then I will quickly talk about the uh, four uh, way to pick the um, brush in, um, uh, you know, when, when you are, when you are looking for a good brush. So the first point you, because I know people want to take notes. The first point is the tip. Okay. When it comes to the tip, what we want is we want it to form a crisp point and we want to form a crisp point. When you have a brand new brush, you can't tell. So basically when you open the brush, when you wet it, it can still go back to a crisp point. And that is the number one point of a good round brush. And by the way, these are all true for watercolor round brushes as well. So you can use that as well. As a matter of fact, I have seen uh, different watercolor blocks. They, um, they basically, you know, like copy the, the Chinese way of picking a brush and use it for their, um, you know, like guidance of how to tell the student to pick brush. The first one, gather to a tip, a crisp tip, very fine point, all right? The second one is called even. Even is what I just showed you earlier. When you have a brush, you press, and you see on my illustration, you can actually see that the hair are kind of the same length. And why is that? It actually means that it will carry a even flow. If the hair has different length, it may not be able to carry an even flow. And when I said that is actually more essential for sumi painting than watercolor. So this particular one um, may not be true for watercolor brushes because the way they are cut, right? Um, however, delivering even flow is still essential to a watercolor brush and you can test it by on, only after wetting the brush. The first one is wrong. Wrong is when you hold a brush, when it is, um, you know, like um, wet with water and gather to a tip, you rotate it and they, it's, it's wrong. I mean, meaning that it's very even and also it has a good belly, okay? Pump belly. And the pump belly means that it can carry a high capacity of water and color. And that is true for a watercolor brush as well. And then the third, the last but not least is something we call strength or resilience. And strength of a brush means the ability to do a good snap and a good spring. And snap and spring are two separate quality when people pick watercolor brush, but then when it's come to the Chinese way of pinking sumi and brush, we collectively put it into one quality, which is the string. And a good snap and a good spring are slightly different. A spring is, maybe I should show it um, here. Um, A good spring, I mean, I'm just wetting my brush. I'm just change this. I just wet my brush, right, with water, and then I have it onto, you know, some color just, just to show it. When I paint something, whatever I'm painting, or it's a calligraphy, when I do something, when I press down, right, what I want is I want the hair to have an ability to swing back to its original shape, right? So there is a kind of like a bounce that naturally want to go back to its original shape, right? And that's called a spring. When it comes to a snap, it actually bounces back. It's it's um it's especially when I go down, it will it will perpendicular. When I go down, it will spawn back up, you know? So it's kind of like the inside core, it's spawn back up, it's a snap. It's kind of like it, when I when I do this, it go back, okay? It's, it's, it's kind of like a snap. And then when it's spring is when it's wet, it will actually hold the shape, right? But but then what what that really means is, um, is, I have to say that that's why we, we want hard hair brush because hard hair has a tendency to have a good bronze and also a good spring, right? But but then it comes to the point of, um, I want to clear a misunderstanding. The, uh, the spring and the snap 
doesn't mean that the stronger is better. A lot of people misunderstood that. They thought that the stronger the snap, the stronger the spring, the better the brush. No, if it's, if it's that, then we'll all use a hard hair brush because since the hair is hard, it will have a very strong spring and a very strong snap because it's hard hair. But the thing is, it really depends on what you're painting. It really depends on what you want. For example, if you are doing bamboo, you want it to spring back so you can get it back to a tip, but you don't want it to be so strong that it resists your movement. Because when you have a very hard hairbrush, it resists your movement. And it's good when you are doing branches. You want it to kind of resist it a little bit so you create a flying white. But you don't want it to be so strong that it doesn't carry the stroke. If you're doing a paddle, you don't want a hard hair brush because you cannot create a paddle because the brush is fighting your the movement of your hand because the hair doesn't want to obey what you are going, the direction you're going. So I just want to clear this with understanding that the better the spring, better the snap, the better the brush. It's not true. It really depends on what you are um, painting, all right? So um, let me see. I do think that I have run out of time. So I will actually show you how to open a brush, how to store the brush and how to clean the brush in the next sessions because I want to make sure you have enough time to grab a bite. And um, I want to actually, you know, clear out any questions you may have on the things that I talk about today. Mm, okay. Um, uh, in the next one, I will show you how to open the brush, how to uh, store a brush and, and that, and I will also add, you know, some other subjects. So um, any particular questions for today? I have a question yes. about the hairs. Mm -hmm. um, do they pluck them out of the animal or no. are they? Oh. No, the animal is dead. Oh. Because, because like, for, for example, when we are doing wool for, for a blanket uh, or, or a sweater, I mean, you know that they, they have to ship, then they shave their hair and then you, 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 make the wool into yarn and then you make a sweater and then the the ship grow back the hair and then you have, you know, like another blanket, you know, like next year. For this, the animal is dead. It, because you, you you see the sample that I, that I show, you know, the one for the weasel is the tail. I mean, the tail is cut and that's why Koninsky uh, brush is so expensive because that particular squirrel or you know you call it it's, it's a kind of squirrel it only lives in Siberia and the better one are the wild one not the one that is you know domesticated so think about it you have to catch them in order to kill it to get the hair and how many brush can one tail make because it's small it's like a squirrel it's small so the same thing with all these brushes. But as I say, they can be rabbit, they can be goat, they can be uh, sheep, they can be bull. And um, some of the rabbit are actually for food. So, you know, the rest of the body go to something else, but then the skin will become leather and then the hair will become brushes. So, so these are all, um, you know, like it's not something that you, that you get out of. I mean, it's, as I say, it's not like my hair, it grow long, then I cut the end tip, then it grow and then I cut it up. Because as I mentioned earlier, once the tip is cut, say for example, if, if I never cut my hair, this is from baby, right? So this can be used, but all this length, there's no use because the tip is not the natural tip. And if it's not the natural tip, it's not of good quality. So we do not use it. We can only use the end tip. So as a matter of fact, you know, like um, I have to say that my my brush teacher of the workshop that I that I got in Canada, um, his wife, you know, when we were having lunch, you know, between workshops, his wife talk about him and he is so crazy that 
when he found roadkill on the road, he would stop his car and pick them up because he wanted the hair to make brushes. Uh, but but that's that's how the hair come from. Come from the tail, from the, the skin of the animal. The animal is that. And um and, and that's for all the natural hair. All right. Thank you. So any any other questions? And by the way, synthetics are used. I mean, nylon is the is the most common one, but then that's why, especially for expensive brushes nowadays, you know, like um, because no one, not everyone can afford a Koninsky, so they they are making nylon that have similar quality as sparrow hair, as um, what they call camel, you know, and and a lot of them um, they are synthetic for the watercolor, and then for the sume brushes, um, what I find out is that um, they are mixed hair. So you will have gold hair, but then in order to buck it up, they will have other materials in it. And sometimes they will mix different kinds of hair, kind of like the more expensive or precious hair. They will use a thinner layer and then um, mixture of other ones in it. And um, But then the higher quality one are all natural hairs, just like the Koninsky. They are real Koninsky hair. Um, so, so by the way, you know, I actually bought some of this um, this is one that I cannot resist not buying. I I was in uh, New York Chinatown and I was just looking at different brushes in a in a brush store, and I find this one with all these really interesting colors. So I asked, um, is the color dye into the brush? You know, like because you can dye the hair, and um, and then the guy said, no, this is this is actually a um, brush from a mountain cat, <laughs> and uh, if you see the the um writing it actually says small mountain cat brush <laughs> and and uh, I just cannot resist it so so I bought this because I I just find it fascinating to have to have this and because it's it's just very interesting I've just never I mean I just cannot walk away you know without buying this so it's a <laughs> mountain cat brush okay and by the way um I do have to warn you that uh some people thought that White hair is gold hair, brown hair is whistle hair, and then the black one is mountain horse and things like that. Um, unfortunately, what I find out is that some, you know, not reputable manufacturer, they dye the hair of the brushes and then make them into brushes. So it could be just white hair, but then they dyed it into a dark brown or dyed it into a red or dyed it into some other color to fool people that they are of different materials. As a matter of fact, I have a student who bought a brush set, you know, like the one that you have that, that have like 15 brushes or 20 brushes that come with a brush set and a brush stand. And then he told me, he said that, John, I don't know why, but my brush is bleeding color. And I look at it and what happened is his brush has red hair, bright red hair. And I told him, I say, you know what? Because it's not the natural color of the hair, the hair has been dyed red. So when you use it for the first few times, the dye actually came out of your brush and that's why you have red painting. <laughs> so, um, so in a way, the, the brush maker actually fooled him that he has 20 different brushes of different kind, but it could be just, you know, inferior brushes that the hair has been dyed into different color. So he thought he have different kind of hair in his collection, but he actually did not, right? So so there are all these, you know, unethical things or, 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 or things that people do, but then um, addition of synthetic material into the natural hairbrush, um, lower the manufacturing cost, so um, it has been done. So uh, uh, you have to, you know, like, um, you know, kind of, you know, like know your manufacturer and things like that. And as a matter of fact, um, I know that there is a, um, uh, a manufacturer that, um, that, that make brushes for Ao Ho Nen, uh, a very famous Ningnan artist in Taiwan. And um, I still remember around, probably 10 years ago, my teacher um, asked me, oh, Joe, do you want some, some more brushes from this particular brand? And I said, 
I have a lot of brushes already, you know, what's up? And then he said, um, if you want to buy some, buy it within this year, because um, the family has decided to discontinue the business. It's a family business. I mean, like the grandpa, give it to the grandpa. Put grandpa, give it to grandpa. Grandpa gives it to the father. Father gives it to the son. But the grandson doesn't want it. You know? and, um, and then they kept it because the artisans that work for the grandfather were elderly. And they, they are skillful in making brushes, but not a lot of other you know, particular um, uh, manufacturing skill. So they kept the business because all the, all the colleagues, all the workers, you know, like um, want to earn a living, continue doing that. So, so the son kept the business, but then the grandson, you know, didn't want the business. And then the, the, the son already kept all the grandfather's generation of employee going, but then the the employee also doesn't want their sons to be in the business. So after all the elderly co-worker move on, and then the grandson say that, you know, father, you have you have done the grandfather's, you know, like good good deed to keep the company, but then I'm sorry, but you know, like I cannot keep this. You know, it's not only money, but then there's no new people going into the industry. So we don't have enough artisans to keep it going. So the company folded. And um, so if you um, see a particular brush of that brand, um, they were manufactured more than 15 years ago. And if you can find new one, you know, thank you. But then, um, uh, you know, like it's just, it's just not the same. So, so um, they are all handmade. They are all um, small business and they are, they are majority of time natural hair, um, and and that's why you know if you have a good sumi brush value them and in the next seminar I'll, I'll talk about how to keep a very good brush and also you know my my uh, little things of what I did when I have a brush that I love but is uh, broken I actually um, you know saved it in a way so so I'll I'll talk about that all in uh, in the next session so uh, do I have any more questions with none I'll actually close this sessions. But thank everybody for coming. And um, if you are interested, I'll be doing the uh, baby chick lessons, you know, at one o'clock and I'll be doing the boat one uh, next Thursday. And of course, if you have suggestions for what uh, what you want me to teach, let me know. Um, I will be more than happy to develop a class on that. I uh, And thank you for everybody for coming and I'm closing the recording. Thank you.